Welcome to our latest edition of Pass the Gloves On. Um, delighted to welcome Rachel Brown Finnis to our series. Um, Rachel, welcome. Thank you very much, Tim. Thanks for having me on. How's um, how's lockdown life treating you? How's things going your end? What's going on? Well, the sun's shining, the squirrels are nibbling the coconuts outside, uh, the birds are singing, so it's uh, better than it has been, certainly. Um, at a time when me and my husband were both at home for three months. We've never, ever done that in the 15 years we've been together, so <laughs> take the kids and homeschooling out of it, that was... Uh, that was probably the biggest learning curve of it all, but thankfully we're all kind of towards the end of it now, we feel, and lights at the end of the tunnel and looking forward to the summer. Yeah, no, us, us too, us too, fingers crossed, eh? So um, really looking forward to this. I know I know, you've, I know you've looked at some of the other episodes we've done with some of the, the great keepers, uh, past and present, so hoping to delve into some of your, well, your vast experience an insight over the years from, I think, being a schoolgirl player right the way up to being an Olympian and obviously now what you do on the TV as a pundit. So um, hopefully be a great insight to everyone who's who's tuning in, really. So, uh, so yes, start, start us off, really. You know, let's talk about, let's talk about the early years. Take us right back to when you started playing. What age were you? What was going on in your life? What was it like? Yeah, um, I, I do remember. So I come from a family that weren't really interested in football. Uh, Mum and dad, not interested. Uh, older brother, not interested. Um, and younger brother, you know, played a bit of football at school. But to that point when I first ever remember kicking a ball, um, it was actually after I went to my first ever game. And uh, my mum and dad and me and my little brother went down to Wembley to watch Burnley, which is my hometown and my home team, uh, play against Wolves in the Sherpa Van Trophy final. And uh, my mum and dad have always had a great sense of adventure. And that was just, you know, a weekend away trip um, just because the whole of Burnley was going. And so we went as well. So we went down on the train in our, you know, little hats and scarves and got to Wembley. And I remember getting off at the tube at the top of of what was Wembley Way at the time and and looking down and seeing like a massive sea of uh, gold of, for wolves and and claret and blue and, you know, being sort of halfway up most people's bodies as, as everybody kind of slowly made Wembley Way and being like completely messed with it all uh, and just couldn't believe, you know, I was seeing the smells, the noises, um, it was just all concerning uh, as a young person, invigorating and, and exciting. Uh, so when we finally got to, um, made it down to Wembley and this, it was the old Wembley with Twin Towers and uh, got there and spent the whole, obviously the match uh, being barricaded by loads of people around us. I remember being pressed up against the fence, not physically, but because I was so itching to see the game and see what was going on, um, that it just had me spellbound. And I think that was probably um, not really necessarily what was going on on the pitch, because I was not familiar with football at all. Um, but everything surrounding it, the environment, the anticipation, the sounds, the crowd, that's what that was my kind of light bulb of, of, of kind of my life. I don't know whether I think about it, I just knew that I'd start. Uh, and whether I was going to play, I didn't really know, but I wanted more of it. Simple as that. Um, remember after that in the playground, I've got a vivid memory of me down back. Look where, you know, you'd pray. Primary school PE teacher, the cup of coffee, and he was the PE teacher um, at the school. Uh, kind of catch his eye left and looked up, and he, he was probably thinking, Who's this mad person diving around the tarmac? And uh, that, you know, I, I felt that would do that. I really loved it. Um, after a year of playground and being that old girl, that teacher eventually relented and let me join in boys' PE, which was down at the playing fields at the bottom of the playground. Uh, and I started to get a chance of playing on grass. 
Um, and I remember throughout the whole time at primary school, that's kind of what I did from then on. Played in the playground. Um, I got to then join the boys team. So I was the first girl to ever play on the boys team because there was no girls teams. Um, and always played on a, a little corner of uh, the golf course. It was called the Triangle. It's a bit of wasteland. And uh, me and my mates used to go and, you know, from first light to last light, we'd be down there kicking a ball around. Um, so great memories from those early days. Uh, and I think quite a lot of the lads who were played with on the school team, um, I, I ended up playing with them at, uh, at the weekend for a team called Bank All United in Burnley uh, in goal, in full-size goals, you know, about the age of nine or ten. Um, and just loved it and just took every opportunity that I could to to play wherever, whenever and who, with whoever. Wow. So what, like, amazing just to hear you, like, you know, recall all their memories and stuff. Like, to what extent do you think that, like, the journey to Wembley, playing with a few older kids, playing with the boys and the stuff, like, how much of that do you think like, influence you as a person and as a sports person eventually? Because that, that they seem really vivid memories. Yeah, they absolutely do. Uh, they are, sorry. Uh, I, you know, I, I remember everything about those moments. And, uh, you know, that's just, I guess, how poignant and how much of... Uh, of a stepping stone each of those memories were in consolidating who I was. You're right. It helped develop my character and what I wanted to do. Um, I think what any sort of, certainly from the era I grew up in where there were, you know, there's a real lack of girls football. That didn't really bother me because, you know, joining and playing uh, with the boys for me, it, it didn't really pose a problem. Um, I had no issue with playing footy with the lads. It was just playing football, simple as that. Um, yeah. the, the only sort of, there was never a barrier, but the only time I suppose I even realised that it was maybe a bit abnormal or, or not something that they saw every day was when we played other teams and, you know, sort of be looking and thinking, is that, is that girl in goal? Uh, and then, you know, as we kind of, our primary school team was pretty good and, um, and we went off to play in, you know, more prestigious tournaments, I guess, if you can call them that. And, you know, word got around before I got there. Um, so I got a bit of a, a gathering, really, of more mums and dads of out of the novelty factor. But it, it never, I never felt pressure from that. I never felt uh, it had a negative influence. If anything, it probably started the habit of a lifetime in wanting to prove people wrong, uh, in wanting to, you know, prove that I was a girl, so what? First and foremost, I was a footballer and I just was just pursuing my passion like everyone else was on the pitch. Um, it only really became a problem and not for anyone's perception. But when I went to secondary school and we couldn't play mixed football at that time, and the FA's yeah. obviously since changed that ruling, um, but there was no, still no girls teams in the area. And so uh, at the age of 12, I joined a women's team. So uh, going, I don't think I've ever, other than primary school, um, certainly for club, I've never played in like junior size goals. Um, <laughs> so just thinking back, um, I remember actually doing an interview during a match we were that good. Um, stood up against the goalpost and chatting to the the Burnley Express who, who followed my career, <laughs> you know, literally from day one. Um, and uh, and you know, just reflections like that of how I've always it's always been fun, you know, whatever whatever stage of my career it's been at. I've always done it because I've absolutely loved it. Um, and uh, I think that's been the driving force from, you know, those early days when there was nothing at, nothing at stake from a career prospect or certainly financially. Um, that's always been my drive because I've absolutely loved it. Uh, and I've always been a goalkeeper. I think, you know, everyone who is a goalkeeper recognises that some of the stuff you do in goal is not what 99.9% .9 of the population are willing to do, whether it's in a football context or otherwise. Um, and I think that does make us special, absolutely. Um, some people might, you know, see that as a negative or, or in a um, in a way that maybe doesn't appreciate skill sets that you need to have as a goalkeeper, both physically mm. and mentally, and certainly more mentally. Um, but yeah, certainly that schooling early on with regards to just playing with boys, um, not letting any kind of anything negative stick. Uh, and really just challenging myself and pursuing what I wanted to do just be for the pure love of the game. Yeah. I think it's 
again, like amazing to hear you. I'm thinking of now parents that might be listening to this or, or carers or, or people who look after the, you know, relatives and kids around why they play football, engaging football and making it fun, making them love it, providing experiences and environment for kids just to, just to enjoy playing really. Like it, hearing you speak there, it, you can see how much that, that environment around, you know, playing and stuff, just, just, you just, it just connected you to the game, didn't it? Made you love the game by the sounds of it. Absolutely did. Um, it was, you know, I always loved throwing myself around on the ground. I always loved the kind of adrenaline that you get from goalkeeping and probably not the same in any other position. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember the first ever game I played for Accrington Stanley Ladies when I joined them at the age of 12, and we played against a team called Crew Robins and we're in Division Million, you know. It just yeah. was a team to play for. Um, and uh, I remember my mum being at the game and uh, pretty much like 20 minutes in, I went flying out at the feet of, of a, you know, a 36-year-old mum of four uh, and, uh, you know, took her out and sort of as a big inhale of, of breath as to, oh, my gosh, what's happened to this tiny little person in goal? Um, and I remember my mum, you know, over the years has said, you don't know how stressful it is watching you play and, yeah. you know, throwing yourself about and putting your, your body on the line. But, you know, in that moment on the pitch, it's, it's exciting, it's fun. It's not something you even think twice mm -hmm. about. It's only literally since I finished football and become a mum and, and have been, I guess, surrounded by non-football people that, you know, they're like, you're a goalie. Like, so you used to sort of throw <laughs> yourself on the ground and... And I'm like, well, yeah, like never, never yeah. crossed my mind at all until I'm in a completely different circle of people who, yeah. who have no kind of insight into the world of football, let alone goalkeeping, who think I'm yeah. absolutely mental. Um, but yeah, I think you're born with that basically innate uh, lack of awareness for your own health and safety, basically. <laughs> <laughs> but um, absolutely. A, a, deep love of of what you do and what you did and you're right I, I think um like you said about the environment it's always been fun and I've always loved um the fact that it's been first fun um when I, I went off to different I went off to US I went off to Iceland basically seeking out almost a not a different set of training methods but seeing what was there what other ways you could uh, improve your goalkeeping, improve your football, but in a you know from a different coaching set, from a different uh, pair of eyes. And uh, you know my time in Iceland and the time in the US were hilarious. So before we move on to talking about when things got a bit more serious and you became a, a young professional, basically, what you've, you've half touched on it there, but you've had this experience at Wembley. You've started playing. Um, with the boys uh, in your school, you've, you've got a team and stuff. Now, what, what, what got you into the actual goal? Because you know the majority of kids there would want to want to play outfield and score goals. What, what pushed you or made you go into goal? Um, I, I generally think early days when I was trying to um, persuade the boys to let me play because I, I distinctly remember the playground was, you know, on the left half was where everyone played footy. On the right half was everything else, skipping, playing hopscotch, chatting, you know, all the stuff. Um, and I'm, you know, kind of edging my way onto the football side of the of the playground. Um, they used to do the old school, like line up against the fence, whoever got picked for the team and and, uh, you know, get picked and, you know, probably reluctantly the lads were, you know, like, oh, if you're well, if you're on our team, go and go. I can imagine that that was the, the scenario, if I'm being honest. Mm. Um, but I, I was probably just thrilled to, you know, be in there. Um, and and then I never remember thinking, oh, I don't want to play in goal. I just always kind of rose to the challenge. And, and, and if that was, you know, I think that's a bit of a how I perceive life onwards, not to get too deep, but you know, whatever situation you're in, make the best of it. That is genuinely how I, I look. I'm a very positive person and and whatever happens, whatever things go right or go wrong, well, what can you do rather than what can't you do? You know, I, I'm always nice, very yeah. much looking forward to solutions to making the best of any situation. Uh, and I think probably that, whether that 
that stems from that or that was just how I viewed that that particular situation so situation early on um just mapped out really how I would view things from that point forwards um you know my friends do say I'm annoyingly positive but you know uh I, I like to I beg to differ on that I think it's uh it's it's helped with a lot of situations both you know during football after football career wise um having two kids uh you know there's a lot of situations you can apply that thought process to that make it easier yeah that, that's what that's what that made me think then was just goalkeeping life in gen goalkeeping on its own life in general you know if you can approach them things positively it's only going to help you know goalkeeping stressful enough at every level let alone the highest level so you know why not have a positive outlook and you look at some of the best goalkeepers in the world male and female and you think how they play the game they do look a bit carefree they do look like they're enjoying it they do look expressive so yeah, i think it's a nice little nice little mantra to have that let, let's let me move you on so you've touched on the challenges uh, once, you know, before the rules change, you weren't allowed to play mixed football over the age of under 11. Um, so you've touched on the challenges of finding a girls team. You've got yourself into a women's team now, you know, at a really young age, age 12. Talk to us about when things got like, you felt things got a bit more serious and uh, more professional and you were becoming involved in more professional environments. What was, what was that like? Well, I think probably the first... Um the first experience I had of it, I went uh, during that kind of year seven, uh, early year eight, when I I was pestering the PE teacher at secondary school to set up a girls team just so I could play regular football. Um, and um, I was training actually with uh, this guy called Leighton James, who used to play for Burnley. He was a goalkeeper. And uh, his son, um, Julian, I uh, part of the bank hall team um, and when it went over to the next year up which I couldn't play in they still invited me down to train with them and that was brilliant so I used to traipse down the hill to to go to training there and uh, it kind of was better than nothing um, and knowing that my or my mum and dad kind of knew that I wasn't going to just give up because there was no way of facilitating goalkeeper my, my football passion there's no way that that was going to kind of be extinguished or, or even diminished temporarily mm. and I'd uh, I'd pestered them to go I used to get match magazine because I love football and um, in the back of that there was an advert for um, Bob Wilson's goalkeeper camp and um, I pestered them for months to let me go on this goalie camp down in London uh, over the Easter holidays. So, uh, yeah, I must have been year eight, so 12. And uh, uh, so they relented eventually and I went down. And so it was my first taste of regular coaching. You know, I went, I think it was five days down there and training all day, every day as you can when you're, you know, a yeah, kid. Yeah. And uh, uh, you know, I met my first proper coach, a guy called Mick Payne, who, who's still... Yeah. Um, active now uh, in the media side as well as coaching and um, we were grouped just to, together as age and I was the only girl on that camp I think it was like 90 odd lads and me and uh, as everybody all parents kind of start to leave and say goodbye we'll see you in a week sort of thing um, you know I was I was left and realized that I was the only girl and it didn't really bother me until sort of some of the lads were kind of like thinking not quite sure how to deal with them like do we talk to her do we kind of like just just a bit of a you know a difference is what I noticed uh, anyway Mick Payne treat me like any other goalkeeper was brilliant and um, so that real taste of of training every day of you know taking everything in hanging on every word of, of my first kind of goalkeeping education really yeah. and I struck up um, a good relationship which I still have today with Mick um, and so from that camp uh i was signposted uh they said look you should be playing for a, a better team simple as that um we think you've got a future and i was like mm, well didn't really don't really know kind of how to progress um mm. and uh anyway so they got me in contact with liverpool can't we fa woman called silva who was for i didn't know at the time but former england player and uh very influential in women's football in liverpool and uh, they got me in contact with uh liverpool and i went on a trial at Liverpool Ladies at the age of 14 um, and they, they signed me up. So I think, you know, knowing that I thoroughly loved that 
minute to minute day to day goalkeeper education made me want to be doing it on a more regular basis and and hearing it from an external source that they thought I could do better that there was understanding that there was you know a flimsy but there was a pyramid uh, in women's yeah. football was really exciting um you know I was fortunate that I had the backing of my mum and dad with regards to you know transporting me over to Liverpool and and so when I signed at the age of 14 um I, I do remember going in um at Liverpool during pre-season in the summer and when I signed and thinking why is there only like seven or eight players and uh, a couple of weeks later literally about at least 10 players arrived back and I realised that they'd come back from uh, the Women's World Cup in Sweden. And I was like, oh, my God, there's an England team. Like, I genuinely had no clue there was an England team. So there I was, having gone from, uh, you know, Accrington Stanley and literally the North West Division 4 to joining Liverpool. And uh, the England goalkeeper, who was the goalie at the time at Liverpool, then retired a few weeks later. And so I was, you know, newly turned 15 in July and about to start the season. And uh, and there I was about to, the first game they said, right, it's at Anfield. Uh, we're playing Arsenal. They won the league the year before. Uh, they got this brilliant, like, centre forward called Kelly Smith up front, but don't worry about it. Um, yeah. And we got beat 6 nil. So I think kind of there's loads of, you know, in that kind of, year of going to Bob Wilson's goalkeeper camp, meeting this coach, getting signposted to Liverpool, going on trial there, getting uh, getting signed, meeting um, England players who, you know, since have been friends for life, um, yeah. being taken under the wing of, of uh, so many of those, you know, senior players and, and then understanding that there was a huge room for progress. That's when I first not only recognised that, I could take this seriously and that I had the ability to be, to, to really progress. Um, but that I really, really wanted to as well, you know, going from a, a hobby that I did once or twice a week, um, but being glued to every bit of football on telly to really understanding that, you know, you could, you know, I could be not a footballer from a career point of view, but this could start to shape certain of the, the next few years you know, talking about steps as finishing school, um, then going to college, whatever I wanted to do, that football would be really at the forefront of all of that. So, you know, I was that was exciting, learning so much from those Liverpool players, um, learning about how, you know, there's an England team, that there were tournaments. Um, it was a massive step, I guess, in kind of figuring out what my own ambitions were. Yeah, wow. Some Some 12 months like that, you know, to... You know, to have your first goalkeeping session, so to speak, and then within a year, be at a professional club with a full-time team, and you know, playing at Anfield, you know, within the space of around a year, is just unreal. And how did you, you know, at age fourteen, fifteen, there? How did you deal with that? As in, like, you know, surrounded by much better players, probably quite some famous players, then people you looked up to, professional players. How did you, how did you cope with that? Well, I think if um, just to kind of put it in the context a little bit, that women's football wasn't professional at that time. It was at the top level, Liverpool. Um, and we went on at the end of that first season to get to the FA Cup final. Um, but we were training three times a week. Um, we Everyone had jobs alongside playing. We didn't get paid a penny for it. Um, so we were all doing it because we absolutely loved it. And we wanted uh, to just make the most of what ultimately is a, a, a really short career. Um, mm. So, you know, there was no financial incentive, certainly. Uh, but probably to get my head around, um, you know, where I was at, what the kind of impending prospects of what I could do, I was young, I was naive, I was probably, and that probably helped me. Uh, you know, I didn't think about getting in the England team. I didn't, I didn't even, I never dreamt of being in the England team because, you know, before it became a reality, I, I barely got my head around that there was, there was, was even an England team. Um, and uh, so I think I just literally was taken in so much so quickly and, and loving every single second of it. Uh, and also being surrounded by such brilliant, supportive characters as well as footballers, the likes of, 
uh, Karen Burke, Maria Harper, Becky Easton, players who, you know, were the early, well, in, in the context of my era, um, early top class uh, footballers. Um, I just, you know, seasons flew by. Um, you know, I was juggling juggling that first season alongside my GCSEs. And uh, I remember playing the FA Cup final in May on the Sunday and coming back and, and uh, being back at school on the Monday. And, um, you know, it, it just wasn't something that everybody saw on the, it wasn't on TV particularly regularly. I think the, that game was live on UK Living, uh, just to give a bit nice. of perspective yeah. as to, um, you know, how valued or not the FA Cup final was at that time. Um, but, you know, it was just, I, I learned early on to be able to, to value football, but also to value um, my education. Um, after my GCSEs, uh, he went out in America to go and work on a camp that he'd, he, he did every year to stay. Uh, just to happened that the family I lived with, uh, the daughter, played on a, a women's football, a girls' football team out there. So for the six weeks I was out there, um, I played for a team called Alabama Angels. And um, I had no idea at all of any infrastructure of football in the US. Um, but yeah. having played for that team just to keep me fit and to uh, just for out of interest, um, then I ended up getting scouted to go to university. Uh, so about I was in doing my start of my A-levels and probably by about Christmas, I started getting letters from different universities offering me full scholarships to go and play football for them and to do my degree. And I couldn't get my head around it because there was no such infrastructure or set up yeah. in this country. Uh, and by this time, starting, you know, 16 and starting my A-levels that I did in French, Spanish, PE um, and biology, um, that I was playing for England. I'd made my debut for England at this point and knew that juggling the A-levels and juggling football, because once you're an international, you're away from whether it's work or education for a week, pretty much every month, um, that that was getting really, really hard. Um, and I actually had a, a medical condition that rose its head at that time, and um, and uh, um, which the doctors put down really to trying to do too much. Kind of, if you imagine you've got a, an energy bank, and I was draining that energy bank with trying to do everything that I wanted to do. So when this opportunity came up uh, to go to the states, it just fitted so perfectly. It, it facilitated football. It facilitated you know, my pursuit of education that I wanted to do. And, um, you know, just the opportunity to go and play football every single day, um, it just came at the right time, was perfect. Yeah. Uh, and I absolutely jumped at the opportunity. Yeah, I bet you did. Um, I'm just thinking about uh, your motivation when you were 14, 15, to get yourself into you know, senior football, more high high level or high profile football, and there being less of a pyramid and less awareness and stuff. What what advice would you give to like some current players, some current younger players, um, around like getting that motivation and understanding the steps you've got to take to achieve the success they, they kind of want to, versus you not having anything to to drive your motivation on. Yet they they now have. Well, probably two things. Um, one is controlling the controllables, and that's a saying that I've I've lived by um, for such a long time. Um, what I mean by that is, if you're on a pitch, play to the best of your ability. If you're in training, be the best that you can be every single time, because who's watching is out of your control. Um, you know who you're playing against is out of your control. Just go out there and play and train and be the best version of yourself. Be professional in what you do on and off the pitch. Um, and then the second thing um, is about taking opportunity. I've already kind of gone over a couple of stories and examples of yeah. where if I'd not have maybe stepped up and been brave or done something that 99% of 12, 13, 14-year-old girls wouldn't have done or situations they wouldn't have put themselves in, then the door of opportunity would have been shut. Um, going on that goalkeeper camp when I was 12 and again on th at 13 when I was the only girl that could have been daunting was a little bit daunting but you know I knew that I wanted to go and be a goalie for a week uh, that second opportunity of going out to America at the age of 15 on my own 
not knowing anyone, flying out on my own, landing at the airport and a guy called Ron picking me up who I didn't know. Um, but taking the opportunity because I get to go and see a different country, meet new people, <clears throat> goalkeeper, be a goalkeeper, learn about goalkeeping. Um, they're two examples. Um, you know, going to Liverpool when I was, I'd never been to Liverpool, the, the town itself, let alone a team uh, of new teammates yeah. that I'd never met or never heard of. They'd never heard of me. Um, there's, you know, numerous examples of, you know, uh, those opportunities, you t- take those opportunities and it breeds an air of confidence uh, of next time at almost a crossroads or an opportunity or a decision comes up because you've done it previously, it always makes it a little bit easier, you know, having the, the, the understanding that, you know, things didn't go diabolically wrong last time. You're making an informed decision based in, based on the pursuit of something that you love doing. Um, yeah. And that made every decision moving forwards just that little bit easier. Um, not always less daunting, but certainly you go into it with uh, knowing that you're following what you absolutely love doing um, and having the confidence that your ability ultimately and, and your willingness to learn and willingness to adapt um, that will really see you through. Yeah, no, I think I think that's brilliant advice. And like, if I was listening to that as a young a young goalkeeper, um, it sounds to me like your ability to focus on the job in hand. You know, the noise around you doesn't matter. Focus on yourself. Focus on the job. Be the best version of you. I think that's brilliant advice. Um, so amazing, you get to America. You know. That must have been an unbelievable experience to get yourself over there. What what kind of challenges did you, you said it was great over there? Like the amount of football you did, your education. What kind of challenges did you face in in moving countries? Yeah, I remember my mum and dad dropping me off at the airport or waving me off at the gates, you know, with a, a big bag, and and then suddenly that little feeling of like, oh my god, I'm actually going off to yeah. live on my own. And I don't, I've not met anyone, and not, I'd met the coach. He'd flown over to to scout me, I guess, watch me play in a Liverpool Everton game. Um, but other than that, you know, all I'd done was watch Forrest Gump, uh, knowing that I was going to the University of Alabama, and thinking, right, well, this is sort of these are the people I'm going to meet. This is what it's going to be like. Uh, so as far as research, you know, it was pretty limited. And like I said, there was, I had no real knowledge or understanding of what the, across the nation, what the college setup was over there. I think it's more well known nowadays and certainly more accessible with, with Google and the internet and stuff. Um, So going out there, I mean, I've always, I have always loved the sense of adventure, to be honest. I probably get that off my parents. Um, They've always loved traveling and, you know, for me, a new opportunity, a new place, a new experience, a new job, if I've never done it before, is far more exciting than something I'd done a million times before. Um, so going off and, and um, seeking out something new, seeking out something different, I suppose is part of my DNA. Um, but you're right, the sort of practicalities of that were that I remember taking the, uh, the maths test to set you basically for because um, when you start off your college degree you, you do every subject you don't do just your um, degree subject and uh, I didn't even know I did the maths test and I didn't know that instead of a multiplication sign like we have a x here they do a dot and so like I was reading I'm like, I didn't even understand the question so I ended up getting in the bottom set for maths and was literally in with like you know not the cleverest of people, no disrespect. Um, but just basic practical things that, you know, if someone would have, if I'd have been able to seek out advice or whatever, would have made things a little easier. But, you know, I can look at those things and laugh now. And there's numerous examples of little things that could have tripped you up. But as I said, I've always been very solution orientated and and not really worried about things particularly um, and always tried to find a way around it. But, you know, that introduction to what was to be what you call a scholar athlete, which is any uh, any person at the university who's on a, a, a sports scholarship was great. Uh, I remember arriving at the American football stadium for the university and it was a 100,000 seat stadium because wow. I, I never knew, knew all about American football. 
Um, but they had a massive, massive program, like multi-million dollar revenue, their own TV channel um, mm. for the Crimson Tide. So I learned loads about university sports, college sports. I met some, again, some friends for life because a lot of us, they might have come from America, but they've flown in from states, from other states uh, to be part of that team. So, we're, you know, in essence, a lot of us were in the same boat. Uh, I do remember stepping off the plane and it being the hottest place on earth I'd ever been to um, and thinking, how on earth am I going to do a pre-season? Um, being yeah. a goalie, running was not like what I was desperate to do anyway, uh, but that's what we did. Most of the time was run. So, but you, you quickly adapt to it. Um, and it was it was a wonderful experience, uh, both on and off the pitch. Um, culturally, Alabama, after 18 months, I recognised was not somewhere I wanted to stay for the whole four or five years that I was going to be out in the States. Um, it, was, it was somewhere that didn't sit easy with me from uh, a racism point of view, uh, from a, a prejudice point of view. Let's generalise that probably yeah. more so, more accurate. Uh, and so, again, you know, I figured, right, well, what can I do? Um, and I decided I wanted to transfer. So I transferred up to the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and, you know, all this time I was fortunate that I was flying back and forth uh, to England to play for England. Uh, so I was kind of keeping my foot in the door, which was, you know, I was very honoured to be able to be given the opportunity to do that because not every England player who decided to go abroad, we were almost actively um, put off doing that. I guess early days, it was purely a financial reason. Um, but, I, you know, I was flown back uh, and played for England regularly. So, yeah, from a, a holistic experience of going to university in the US, I didn't want it to be purely judged on on football. The football side of it, I absolutely loved. The kind of living in a different country and the cultural side of it, I wasn't happy with. So I did something about it um, and, and got the chance to transfer up to the University of Pittsburgh. Really good from an educational point of view, Big city, you know, kind of reminded me of of the north of of certainly very much more European, um, okay. and I really liked it. Uh, so I was glad I made that decision, uh, and also kind of I, I got the chance when I was out there, and this is a this was a big kind of light bulb moment for me. Um, I got the chance to go out to the ninety nine women's World Cup final because it was the US against I think it was China, um, and they played at the Rose Bowl, and uh, my best mate, her mum, dad for mine and hers birthdays that were both in July, got us flights and accommodation and tickets for the World Cup final. And uh, I remember sat in the stand as a fan thinking, this is an amazing spectacle. And then like a little kind of thing in my brain went, these are like international footballers. These are who I want to be playing against. They're playing in a World Cup. We've never, you know, in the new era of of being under the FA, we'd not got in touching distance of a World Cup. Um, I'd not played Euros at this point and I was thinking well this isn't right these girls are household names they are millionaires they are massive commercial assets their level of football is is ridiculous and compared to ours and I think spending my time out in the US and, and almost living as a professional player and then seeing where football could take you or where we should be as an England national team where we should be as an international team that was reignited a huge drive in me to make women's football better, to get us up to a better level than we have, than we currently were. And, uh, you know, from a fitness point of view, from every aspect. um, And from that moment forwards, I I never was quiet about voicing those opinions to people on our team in in England, people in authority at the FA, you know, it was always that, nibbler in their in the ear of anyone who I could get to who I could talk to about how we need to drive change how how things are so different in the US and what they look like and and um you know because things weren't as readily available on the internet certainly streaming wise that wasn't available so you know were they aware of this and if they were aware well why weren't we better why weren't we putting things in place to get better um so I'm not saying I was the reason for that change but I certainly over my career as an international player Obviously, I've seen a huge change, um, and I personally was had that ignited in me from that moment um, of a being feeling like a professional player, playing every day at uni, uh, but seeing that World Cup final was like right. It's 
let's do everything I can. Let's do everything we can to get to anywhere near that level. And it made me realize that it's purely simply hard work as much as you can do. And then when the resources start coming in, take it to the next level and keep taking it to the next level. Yeah. And you must be, well, I don't know, proud, happy, elated when you, when you look at like, what the what the women's super league looks like now, what the feeder leagues to it look like, what the participation in in girls' youth football, in women's football looks like. You, you that must be a real nice kind of link for what you saw back in the nineties to what you're seeing now. You must feel so well, how do you feel about that? Because you've you've played a part in it. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, 18 years as an England player, um, starting off in that moment where Uh, We were a bang average team. Everybody was amateur to where I left it, which was a, you know, we were all fully professional. We had England central contracts. Uh, The perception of women's football had 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 a massive shift. We'd hosted a a, a European championships in 2005, which was a big springboard for that. We'd qualified for our first World Cup uh, in 2007 since uh, that World Cup in 99, which was prior to... um, sorry, 95, um, which was prior to us going back under the FA. So uh, we then hosted the Olympics and to have been a part of that team and to see the platform that that gave us, to see 75,000 people at Wembley pretty much all shouting for us. Yeah. All of those, for me, are, are real markers in the sand of where we, from that moment forwards, women's football was driven forwards. Um, and I think since finishing... I've continued to see that progress, as you referred to, with the Women's Super League becoming fully professional. Huge, huge uh, moment. I mean, the inception of the, of the Women's Super League itself was a, a big shift, but then to see it going fully professional was massive. To see the viewing figures smashed uh, in the 2015 and then the 2019 World Cups, it's all been progress from, from that moment forwards, uh, and it does absolutely fill me with nothing other than immense pride at everybody, everybody who's been a part of that journey from the administrative people like Kelly Simmons at the FA um, to the people um, like Rachel Pavlo at the FA who've been involved since that first day uh, to Hope Powell who was the first ever full-time manager, it took the whole Structure academies, um, centers of excellence, whatever we call them now, is uh, the youth England teams that weren't there before. Um, so yeah, everybody's played absolutely a part, um, and it does. I have absolutely no bitterness or resentment, nothing negative at all, because I think I know that I've been a part of of that momentum, um, and it does continue to sit, fill me with pride. The fact that I'm still involved. Uh, in in the capacity that I'm involved in a media sense um, and able to um, still fly the flag for women's football, to still promote women's football, understanding that I've got a real platform uh, and duty to keep promoting women's football. Because that's a big difference between uh, women's football and men's football, that we are uh, in touch and distance with our fans. We have built a rapport with our fans and we've always felt a sense of, not duty, but we just want to promote our sport. We want as many people to know how hard we work, but also how normal we are. Um, mm-hmm. And so, I, you know, I continue to do this to this day, and uh, that gives me a huge sense of pride. Yeah, no, it, it, it is quite, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but just to hear you speak about it, like it just comes across comes across so strong and passionately, and yeah, just I can only commend, commend you for what you've done, and I'm just thinking back to the previous section around enjoying yourself, making things happen, being positive, taking things by the scruff of the neck. You know, it probably all links in, doesn't it? That you've 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 seen something, you've been passionate about it, and you've done everything you can to go and get it. So, um, I think that's a good example of where it, it works in in goalkeeping, but it works in life as well. So, oh, amazing. Um, so, go on. You're back in England. Uh, you've had your you've had your five years, four or five years in in the states, back over with Everton. Yeah, uh, when I when I was no, I was just going to say when I was uh, coming back to uh, England. Um, when I was coming back to England, 
I uh, my options Liverpool had gone down basically. Um, and when I was coming back to to England, uh, it was Mo Marley, who was the Everton manager at the time, who got in touch with me um, and signed me up in January. That's when I, I'd graduated and was coming back uh, and went straight into that team and uh, and remained with them till the very end. Um, I think, you know, I'm quite a loyal person by nature, but, uh, you know, we had such a core of brilliant players that I wanted to try and maximise what what we could achieve with that with that team of players, um, and you know they are some of my best friends to this day, like Sir Jody Hanley and Lindsay Johnson, uh, who both played for England as well as Everton for a long time. Farrah Williams, um, all still really really close um, and fantastic players, you know. And we had a, a great balance of um, international players at that time, and it was it, it was. Some of the who were younger players at the time, likes of Farah, likes of Jill Scott, Lucy Bronze, um, they Tony Duggan, Nikita Paris, they're all players who who do kind of come back to us older players as we were at the time, senior players, True. to say how their sort of schooling on how football should be played, how you should conduct yourself as a, a senior player, um, just how important those that, that way of working and that rapport that we built with those younger players and the the recognition of where how women's football had changed, but also some of the things we needed to keep the same, that grounding, that um, understanding that nothing less than 100% was acceptable uh, and that, you know, if you weren't doing that, you were affecting everybody, not just your, yourself. Uh, that that sense of nobody's too big to do the most menial of jobs, um, and that's on and off the pitch. That sort of for me, hearing that was made me feel again a sense of pride that not just that you'd had those beliefs in yourself uh, and those morals and, and ethics and and work ethics that hmm. that actually you'd been able to pass those on and have been able to affect in a positive way, kind of the next generation of players. Uh, and that wasn't me and senior players who initiated that. That was the way that we were taught uh, that stood us in such good stead and and yeah. ensured that we had longevity in our careers, both on the pitch uh, and also, you know, a lot of the things that we learnt and I've been able to reflect on since I've retired, as you said about some of the goalkeeping aspects of mentality, have absolutely been wonderful in um how to deal with um with adversity off the pitch beyond your career of football yeah. um, you know, having that positive outlook having that kind of solution oriented outlook on things being able to um you know join in with a new team and suddenly build a rapport with them because you have to do that instantly as a, as a team player uh, being able to understand different individuals because they are different characters and different people need to be spoken to in slightly different ways are motivated in different ways and you know there's so many life skills that you learn from playing football from being part of a team that have upon reflection of, of finishing are very very valuable in everyday life to life but also so in industry as well i want i'd like you to talk about now if you can um you're probably an established player now you're in a you're in a successful everton team a winning Everton team. Um, uh, you've come through quite a big injury in your career, I think, uh, around 2005-ish, was it? You had quite a big injury. Uh, so talk to us about overcoming the injury, but then talk to us about, you know, the success you went on to achieve, uh, one, with kind of with Everton, but secondly, with, with England as well. Yeah, uh, I think it was 2004, uh, Tom Acrucia, um and uh, out for nine months after that, pretty much. Um, good people around me. Um, it was difficult because we didn't have really the resources with regards to physio um, mm. to really kind of do the gold standard job that you would have wanted to do. So, um, but that's just how things were. Uh, and so it was find a way. So I remember being in a full, full leg cast, plaster cast, being in the gym, doing what I could do. Uh, but, you know, being in a full leg cast was pretty restrictive. Um, but, yeah, having kind of the support around me, uh, you know, again, on reflection, um, was absolutely gold dust, was something that 
would have been so much harder and so less easy to come through if I'd not had good friends and people around me. Uh, so I did that. And um, yeah, then we had the Euros 2005, which was, you know, a huge highlight at the time, mainly up in the Northwest as well. And coming from Burnley, that was brilliant to have so many local people be able to see me in action and to see where his football was at at that point. Um, as you said, a big core of that was was Everton players. Uh, we won the FA Cup, we won the League Cup. Um, we went to the final day with Arsenal, who were you know going to be quadruple winners at that, that point, um, to try and snatch the league off them. Uh, so it was a great environment to be in. Um, and Mo Marley was very ingenious in some of the, the plans that she came up with, with the lack of resources that she had from a financial point of view to bringing in some of the best players. Uh, players were willing to sort of drive three hours each way to training, um, three times a week to play for a team. So that's a marker really of, of you know, what she brought um, every session. And um, it was a real pleasure to be a part of that. And as I said, you know, I, I felt a duty and, and a desire to want to finish out my time there. Um, and I think, you know, with Everton progressing behind the scenes, you could see kind of what, Mo Marley and Andy Spence wanted to achieve uh, on behalf of their players. Um, but then going back to England, again, 2007 was a tricky time. It was great. We qualified for the World Cup, but sort of uh, a few months before that, we finished uh, qualification for it. Um, we had to go away to France and get a draw in the last qualification game. Uh, and um, quite hostile environment, 30,000 fans. and uh, But we, we did it. And, you know, every time you kind of, become a part of history of that first ever time it's just it's so satisfying and um and I think I said earlier on that you know that was the marker and we've never not qualified for a world cup since and you know that was a proud moment to kind of be part of that first ever um but six months before I was having real problems with my knee um I had some bone growing on the underside of my kneecap and um, it was literally every single step going up and down the stairs at home um let alone talking about how it incapacitated me in training somewhat. Um, but ultimately, I went down to the surgeon in London. He said, look, if, so, you know, at this point, I'm 27, 26, 27. He said, I would tell you to retire if you're a male footballer, because by this point, you'd be a millionaire and you'd played for England for 10 years and I'd have had, you know, a pretty successful career. He said, but, mm. you know, I know you won't do that. So I'll tell you what your options are. Um, so he said, you either play through the pain and get your surgery after the World Cup. Um, and you might be, you know, playing at 80%. I kind of estimated as um, what how good I was compared to how good I was prior to that injury. Um, or you get your surgery and maybe not play in the World Cup. So I played through the pain. Um, and at this point, sports science had come in. We were training every single day on our central contacts, contracts for England. We could do that, which was great. Uh, but it was bloody hard work and it hurt a lot literally a number of ibuprofen and yeah. injections and stuff like that to get me through it um it's probably not something i want to reflect on particularly uh but it's just what i wanted to do at the time it was my decision uh so yeah world cup was was unbelievable um and it spurred us on to want more of it we wanted to be in every euros we wanted to be in every world cup and thankfully that's been the case ever since yeah, amazing. And I, I, I'm going to ask you this question now from one, a selfish point of view, but another point of view, I think this will benefit some, hopefully some coaches or aspiring coaches listening in. So um, I was aware you had a couple of coaches then, uh, but what one coach probably stands out um, in Keith Rees, uh, who worked with you at Everton and at England. Um, so two questions. Um, what kind of what kind of attributes did did Keith bring along with him as a person as a coach, which benefited you? And what advice would you give to some coaches who who are now involved in coaching um, girls or women's goalkeepers? Um, I think probably the top thing about Reese uh, was that it was always a, a two way dialogue. Uh, there was always room for discussion. Not negotiation necessarily, but discussion about yes. things. Yeah. And that I think is quite empowering as a player. Uh, if your point of view is appreciated, is is wanted to be listened to, um, then you know, not only does that 
make you as a goalkeeper want to make your own decisions, which ultimately when you're on the pitch, that's what it's all about. Um, but it also kind of, it's got a great breeding ground for learning. Um, you know, if I can take on his point of view, he can take on my point of view, then surely two points of views, um, you come up with more ideas. And that's not just solutions, that's also creative ideas on how to train. Um, so I think that was a real kind of, uh, one of, of Reese's real strengths, because um, he'd seen you know, the women's game grow and adapt. Mm -hmm. And, you know, well, you think just the practicalities of, of uh, female goalkeepers, we're not all six foot five. Um, you know, you, you might have come through your FA level one, level two, goalkeeping A, B. And if you've never worked with females, I'm not saying that goes out the window, but there's a huge amount of that that needs to be adapted to your average female goalkeeper. Um, you know, I'm five seven, five eight at best. And so all of my training was focused around agility, um, about refining my technique as much as possible, um, you know, coming for crosses, being able to drop step to get back to tip, uh, tip the ball over, covering the ground as quick as I could, uh, maximising my power so that when I did get that perfect technique that, you know, I was at maximum power to be able to execute it. So I think... Um, he always had an open mind. I know he did um, quite a lot of training on the NLP, neurolinguistic programming, and retraining thought processes, and being able to apply that to a goalkeeping context. I think uh, keeping minds open is really, really important, um, not just in a goalkeeping context, but just having that thirst for learning um, from both a coach and from a player. Yeah, brilliant. No, I think you summed up Reese really well there. And, um, you know, I think anyone who worked with Keith would have benefited from him as a coach, but also him as a person. So what, What? because more, more, there's, there's, there's definitely more coaching um, opportunities for goal, uh, female goalkeepers now. What advice would you give to um, coaches now who, are, who may be coming across coaching uh, young female players or women's players? I think um, it's a, a very special opportunity to work with, to be a goalkeeper coach, to work with a, a team of one or two or three goalkeepers. You compare that to your average coach who, you know, if they've got the luxury of working with just a defensive unit or midfield or forwards, that's unlikely. You know, usually they're working with a squad of outfield players. So as a goalkeeper coach, you're in a, um, a privileged position that you're working with a small group. So I think just, um, and if you usually as a goalkeeper coach, you're either a former goalkeeper or, or have a real appreciation for the position of goalkeeping, because it's so different to outfielders. Um, it, it, it's kind of almost impossible for... Uh, an outfield coach to successfully coach a goalkeeper. They could maybe do it from a technical perspective, but I think uh, to really have walked in the shoes of a goalkeeper to understand what they go through in a match, in training, from a physical, but more so from a psychological perspective. Um, I think uh, if you're a goalkeeper coach, working with either young females or with um, adult females, I the way I think it's really important to not not um not cast aside importance of mentality of uh, the psychological side of the game uh, yeah you can work on technique but I found probably certainly towards the end not the end but say like the latter the second half of my goalkeeping career my focus was 90% on mentality on the psychological aspect on visualization on anything that could get me from a wide focus to really having the blinkers on getting over that once you walk on that white line it's just literally about the game um being able to calm all that noise was a real kind of strength of mine um i'd go out before a match and vision you know say, say like a world cup match or a match where you can have a big crowd in go out before the match visualize a full stadium hear the crowd what the tannoy everything that was i was gonna come across and you know then i went back into the change rooms and my brain had already processed that so that i didn't have an emotional reaction to it when i came out you know i went out and just did my warm-up and 
sang the national anthem and got into the game just like I would if there was no one there because I'd already kind of processed it and gone through it and prepared for it. So I think some mental strategies, if you, if you, as a goalkeeper coach, if you haven't delved into that, that's a massive, massive part of being a goalkeeper because, yeah, you might be able to make saves and that's obviously a huge part of goalkeeping. But if you uh, haven't got the capacity to get over mistakes, if you haven't got the, the capacity to... Uh, mentally prepare yourself then you might not be in the best state emotional state to go out there and make those saves so it's kind of like dealing with that is really the foundation for all the technical stuff yeah no uh, brilliant brilliant advice and I think what that means to me well the note I'll be writing down after this is is um you've got to consider the demands of the players that you're working with not just the demands like you mentioned technically but what stresses are in a game, what stresses are before a game or after a game um, and, and how do you give or help people have some coping mechanisms? I think that's a brilliant advice. Thank you. Really, really good. So moving on slightly, I want, to, I want you to talk about the end of your playing career and what happened next, you know, your route into, into where you are now. So tell us about the, the last couple of years of your um, playing career Becoming an Olympian, which I really wanted to speak about because, like, you know, one can only imagine what that is like, you know, watching it on the telly as a kid to then being there. So talk to us about the Olympics and talk to us about your your transition into uh, retirement. Yeah, uh, I mean, I would have to say that the Olympics was the highlight of my career. And um, considering I didn't step on the pitch and play a minute of it, uh, you know, that tells you how special it was. Um, mm. You know, I, I've absolutely no bitterness about that, but I just wanted to kind of uh, put put it in kind of perspective. Uh, I think for a number of reasons, like you mentioned, growing up watching the Olympics, absolutely adulating um, any Olympian who walked the face of the earth, um, thinking that that was just, they were like super supermen, you know, uh, superheroes who were untouchable in some ways. And then for to be in the discussion that we were actually going to have an Olympic team because we we're hosting it. Uh, and then for me, from a personal point of view, to what I did, uh, I think about eight months before selection for the Olympics, I decided that because up until that point, I've been working full time alongside playing, um, working as a teacher. And um, I decided that to give myself a chance of getting in that Olympic squad, because uh, it was only going to be two goalkeepers rather than three, like it's normally for World Cup and Euros. It was obviously going to be opened up to all the home nations as well, that I need to just do football and nothing else. Um, and, you know, I have as much rest time, feet up time, as much as I could, so that I'm training at the best uh, level that I could. And uh, I, I felt like all the stars were in line, really, for at the age of 32, to be selected for that squad. You know, for, as I said, for them to, to actually be a first ever women's GB team, uh, for it to be in our home nation, to then walk out on that pitch at Wembley to play Brazil um, it, it, in front of 75,000 people. You know, if you're growing up, whether you're male or female, if you're growing up as a young footballer and they said that that was going to happen, you just think that it's like virtually impossible. So I guess with that being pretty much, 25 years to the day from when I went first ever went to Wembley as a youngster to watch my first ever match. And it still gives me goosebumps right now talking about it. Um, for that first ever spark to be ignited, for that to come full circle pretty much and like to reflect on the six knee surgeries I've been through, the journeys to living in America, my health condition that I'd um, so I got diagnosed with epilepsy at 16 and I've had that ever since. So I've been able to manage that. Um, the support that I'd had, the progress of women's football, everything that went into I'd, what I'd seen in kind of last 18 years of playing, um, that all kind of came to a, that that was almost like the reward for everything good or bad that I'd been to, to everything that I'd seen everything that I'd been involved in the involvement of women's football, that was that moment. Uh, and that, that's why it was so special. Um, and I remember when we went, walked into the Olympic Village, you know, every, I wanted to soak in, as everyone did, wanted to soak in every single bit. And we got to the Olympic Village and I remember Dame Kelly Holmes, 
introducing us and it was it was the women's team and the men's football team who were like in this small classroom yeah. being uh, introduced by Kelly Holmes and her saying you know whatever you win you don't win you are and always will be an Olympian and I remember that though her words then just me thinking oh my god I can't believe I'm, I'm an Olympian like it was just it was just insane and I remember how emotional it was um so yeah, for all of those reasons I've waffled on about, that's why it was so special. Uh, and it, and again, it was an opportunity for women's football to be given a huge platform for so many people to see it uh, or to actually physically be there. Um, it was an amazing, amazing moment. So then talking about after football, uh, I decided to finish. It was when we were in the spring series. So we played our football in summer, uh, finished in October. And I was going to be going back for another pre-season in January. And I just decided that physically, you know, it was not doing my knee any favours. Mentally, I'd pretty much run out of, uh, you know, the desire to want to put my body through that again. Um, and at that point, I was, uh, I think I was 34, I'd been married for quite a while, a few years at that point. And, you know, me and my husband already discussed that, you know, he was happy to wait till we'd finished, I'd finished football. Uh, but then after that, we wanted to have kids. And, you know, that was simple as that. And I think uh, with that frame of mind, with regards to football, I think I was done. I'd played in some World Cup qualifiers leading up to what was going to be the World Cup uh, in the summer yeah. following my retirement. Um, I got the opportunity to um, cover some games for the BBC. And I'd not really done much like that before. I'd done interviews and I'd done photo shoots and bits and bobs like that. Um, and I actually got, uh, I remember a guy called Phil Bird uh, at Burnley Football Club um, who invited me down to do co-commentaries. He said, can't offer you anything, but you know, if you fancy it, we think you'd be all right at it. So I went down and did a few of those and I was like, God, I really love this. This is like really fun, you know, chatting about football, being able to give insight into the tactical stuff. And um, and so when I got the chance to do that for the BBC and obviously I had an insight into the squad and what each of the individuals were like and what the environment was like. And Mark Sampson, who was the manager at the time, I'd worked under him for the last couple of years. So uh, I did that and oh, thoroughly loved it. At this point, I was um, expecting our first child. Uh, and it worked great. I was like, great, don't have to do anything physical. We can just go down and talk about football. Um, and so I love that. And, you know, I was fortunate that after that, after having Zara, um, my husband, um, he, he loved me being involved in football still. He knew that it was my driving force and my passion. Uh, and I got more and more bits of stuff. And I guess being freelance and continuing to be freelance, uh, you can... I wouldn't say pick and choose in an arrogant way. I just mean pick and choose as to what logistically works for having a family. Yeah. Um, it's been been brilliant. Uh, and then um, at nine months, when, when my daughter was nine months old, my husband got a new job. So he's pretty much nine to five before that. He got a new job where he now is a, a caddy on the golf tour and uh, is away for about 40 weeks a year. Uh, <laughs> so that was all, also uh, something to consider um, when we were going to have our second one, which we, we have now. Um, you know, from a logistical point of view, what work could work and what work wouldn't work. Um, and so I've absolutely loved my journey in pursuing different aspects of media. I've never had any formal training in it. So it's sort of learning every time I'm on set or every time I'm at a match. Um, but I think everybody knows who's been involved in football just because you're your body's too knackered to carry on with it, it doesn't mean the desire and the love of football diminishes in any in any yeah. uh, capacity at all. And I, I feel fortunate, um, you know, I still work hard at it, but I still I feel fortunate for that first opportunity I got to be able to, I suppose, prove that I still have the love for it and the desire for it and the, the willingness to learn and to progress in football beyond my playing days. Yeah, amazing. And I think like I think that's probably a nice way to start wrapping it up. And you know, you you talked about the Olympics being the um the result of everything you've done in your career. And, you know, I have to say and you know, in a jealous way, you know, you massively, massively deserved everything you felt and achieved there because, you know, what you'd gone through to reach that and the steps you'd taken, the challenges you'd faced, 
what you've achieved, the struggles of, you know, amazing for you to to achieve that. And then and then also stepping into um punditry, you know, having seen you on the telly, on the radio, the articles you've done, you know, duck to water really. So um much deserved, <laughs> much deserved. And you know, I can only congratulate you for that. It's 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 great to watch. Thanks, Tim. I, I think like the the sort of lasting message I want to say um, to anyone who's watching is is to live by those things, control the controllables. I think in this day and age of social media, that's a massive one. You know, you can't do anything about what people put on social media. Um, you can't do anything about a lot of stuff. So don't waste any energy on worrying about it. Control what you can do. Make sure you're prepared, you research, you're, you, you're always open-minded and willing to learn and then give it your best shot every time you're out there. Um, you know, that's that's uh that's been across football and then since i finished playing football it's quite a if you can if you can make that as black and white as you as as possible the easier it is you know you focus on what you can do and what you can change and don't focus at all on what you can't you know that's just noise and and most of that is 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 unwelcome noise um you know i I seek my feedback from people who who have an influence on, on my career uh, not just in a positive way. I'm saying both, um, you know, feedback. I'm open to criticism, absolutely. But from the people who who have a um, an educated um, perspective on it, uh, and so and never ever um, forget kind of where you started and why you started doing it. And absolutely, that's always been at the core of what I do and why I've done it is because purely I absolutely love the game. Before you go, four questions, quick fire. You've got three seconds to answer each one. Um, so not too much thinking, just instinct. First question, favourite training session? Um, living in Iceland, diving down a volcano, slalom style, uh, around the poles. First training session in Iceland, amazing. Wow. Well. I think that, that needs its own uh, that's own section, I think. Um, superstitions? Um, never took my gloves off. So once I'd warmed up, got in the changing rooms, once my gloves were on, that was it. Didn't take them off. Um, refused to, um, you know, I had my warm-up top on for England and stuff like that. They had to pull them off me. I wasn't taking my gloves off. <laughs> Brilliant. Favourite goalkeeper of all time? Male, Peter Schmeichel, he was my role model growing up. Um, I loved how aggressive he was on the pitch, how authoritative and assertive and the massive organiser that he was. Um, He was kind of like stood out massively for me. Female, um, I think currently the best goalkeeper in the world is Anne Katchenberger for Chelsea. She makes saves that you don't expect goalkeepers to make. Uh, I've loved seeing how she's really um up to the level of goalkeeping uh, not just in this country but i think world worldwide because it's come under a lot of cri- criticism over the years yeah here yeah, here yeah. agree and then last question your biggest influence in football um from a practical point of view probably mick payne and the opportunities that he gave me um and where they led to ultimately uh, and then from a teammate perspective uh, pauline cope who was the england goalkeeper before i went yeah. in you know, I went in as a young pretender. She's probably thinking, who's this after my job? Uh, but was nothing but full of information and insight and advice um, and continues to be so today. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so, Rach, thanks so much for coming on. Um, absolute guarantee that, s- that people who listen to this will get so much from it. You know, play- uh, players, coaches, parents, everyone really so thanks so much been really insightful i've enjoyed it hope hope it's been okay for you and i really appreciate you coming on thanks tim i have thoroughly enjoyed it and you know i love working with people with players young players and uh you know if i can inspire or be a role model to anyone then uh you know you know i've put the hours in but it's an absolute pleasure for that